Hi, welcome again, everyone, to another financial analysis video with myself, Moe Damin, and my colleague, Ted Wayman. Uh, today, we're going to be analyzing another financial institution, uh, HSBC, uh, and uh, really interested to look, uh, to share kind of numbers with you here. Um, before we do so, very quick note, right? We're not here. If you're expecting us to um, help you decide on whether to invest in this company or not, that is not what we're going to do. There are plenty of other people out there that can help you do that. A purpose for our, uh, our shows, oh, sorry, our episodes in the show is to help improve uh, your analysis and understanding of financial fundamentals. So being able to read financial statements, to make more informed decisions based on the financial statements and the financial numbers, right? That is what we're here to do. This is an education platform, not an investment advice platform. So uh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. And also if you are a subscriber uh, and if you're one of those people that, uh, well, one of those many people that make requests to us about companies that you would like us to analyze for you, uh, as a subscriber, you will get instant notification of when we publish that video. So it's in your interest to do so. So let's go into it. HSBC, uh, multi British multinational investment bank. Uh, and actually some interesting stats and figures, which is worth knowing before we um, dive into the financials. Uh, second largest bank in Europe. Uh, and they have a total equity of uh, 204, just over 204 billion US dollars. And they have assets of almost 3 trillion US dollars. It's a pretty large bank. And actually, they have about 7,000 offices around the world in 80 countries. So pretty large business. And, and uh, you know, as of last check, they serve about 40 million customers. So very large institution. What's interesting is a lot of people may not know actually exactly what HSBC stands for. So in 1836, they were founded in Birmingham. Uh, and they were originally called the Birmingham and, Birmingham and Midland Bank in the UK. It was not until 1865 that they became known as the Hong Kong Shanghai, right? So Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, HSBC. So worth knowing about that. Um, share price, we're gonna come on to that later on actually, so stick around to the end to look at that. Um, but, you know, floated in 1988, uh, sorry, 1993, apologies. Benefit of hindsight, you would be up about 190% um, over that time. In the last five years, you would have been down, and we'll talk about that, but it's around 19%. Uh, and in the last year, you would have been up 39% if you invested. So it's definitely bounced around a lot. We're going to talk a bit about that later on as part of that context of the finance. So stick around for that. Um, so let's uh, jump into this. Uh, Ted, over to you. Let's share with our viewers what we've uncovered about the financials for this uh, this very large financial institution. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Moe. Yes, good to see you again. And uh, welcome to all of our viewers. <coughs> so let's have a look at their financials. Um, and this is their annual report and account. It's 2020, so the 2021 isn't available um, as at the time of recording this video. Uh, it'll still, still be another couple of months before that comes out. Um, and uh, this is a big document, uh, 382 pages. Um, uh, and if we want to find the financials, we need to actually go all the way down to page 280. So everything that goes before, and you know, we've seen lots of... Uh, uh, lots of uh, reports on this um, uh, on this channel, um, uh, but you know this is this is really kind of pushing the boundaries. I don't think we've ever had to go for 280 pages before we actually get to the numbers. But lots of uh, useful information if you want to kind of understand the bank, where they're operating, what their strategy is, etc., um, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Lots of information there um, in the previous 279 pages. Highly worthwhile looking at. But we are going to limit ourselves, as you mentioned, to the financial analysis. We're just looking at the numbers now. Important thing to remember, when we look at a bank, they are very, very different to a corporate. So if we've been looking at Coca-Cola, we've been looking at Tesla, uh, we've been looking at, you know, mining companies and car manufacturers and, and you know, a whole variety. Uh, and we get very similar kind of numbers coming through, I, similar format. And therefore, we can run similar ratios. Banks, completely different because banks use money to make money, whereas uh, people like Coca-Cola use money to, uh, you know, create Coca-Cola to make money, so to speak. So banks use money to make money and it's to make that important distinction. 
So um, from the top, here we are in the income statement. Uh, just a quick note, we are dealing in millions of dollars. You can see up there, millions of dollars. So when we say revenue of uh, 27, uh, 27,578, that's 27,000. That is obviously 27 billion. Um, so $27 billion um, in income. Now, this first part is the net interest income. So what we've got here is they're kind of, they're totaling upwards rather than downwards, just to keep you on your toes. Um, so they're totaling upwards rather than downwards. And what they're basically saying is 41 billion interest income. That is what they charge you uh, to borrow money from them. So whether you've got a credit card uh, or a mortgage or a personal loan or anything like that, they're charging you $42 billion. Hopefully not just one person. That's going to be obviously everybody. Um, where do they get the money to lend to you? Well, they get it from people like me. I actually have a bank account with um, uh, these guys and um, you know I have my money on deposit and they pay me an interest. And you'll notice there the interest they pay me is very significantly lower than the interest they charge their clients. And so the difference is effectively their net interest income, that 27 billion. So yeah, that's a big old margin. They cost them 14 billion uh, and they lend the money out at 42 billion. They make a 28 billion um, uh, profit. Now, this is an important point here because these guys make money from effectively like a spread uh, on the interest rate. And as interest rates go up, obviously, both the interest income and the interest expense will go up. But as those interest goes up, that spread becomes bigger. So banks like high interest environments. OK, so the higher the interest, the more the banks like it. Uh, very, very important, because if you're reading the papers and you're thinking about inflation and you're thinking maybe the inflation isn't as transitory as we thought, and you think that in, uh, central banks are going to start raising interest rates, the banks are going to benefit from that. OK, so a uh, very important aspect there. The next part is their net fee income. OK, so we've got the kind of the net interest income and the net fee income together. And again, they're mainly making fee income. And that'll be you know the fee they charge you to, uh, uh, you know, uh, arrange your mortgage, for example, the fee uh, that they charge you for going uh, into an unauthorized overdraft um, and also a uh, trading fee. So this is an investment bank as well as a commercial bank. It's basically what's known as a conglomerate. Um, uh, and so. Uh, you know, they'll be running, you know, trading desks, for example, uh, and they will be charging their clients fees um, uh, to trade through those desks, uh, and they're making 15 billion. Um, they are also um, uh, running a financial instrument. So this is uh, this kind of this 10 billion, this is going to be things like, um, uh, you know, derivatives, for example, so they're going to be running their own book, and they're making another 10 billion on that. So we've now got quite a sort of substantial amount of money coming through. And then we've got a whole lot of other um, uh, uh, stuff coming through. Uh, there's an insurance arm to it. So there's the insurance premium coming in. Um, uh, the insurance premium, uh, we really need to be kind of, you know, uh, 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 netting off against the insurance claim. So we need to kind of just uh, compare these two numbers. So their insurance book isn't performing quite as well as they would like. Um, they're making a little bit of a loss on that. Um, but there is the total income, 63 billion, take out the insurance claims, and you've kind of got this, this um, operating income of uh, $50 billion. Okay, and $50 billion, you can see that little bit off the boil since uh, previous years. Um, and, uh, you, you know, that may be due to, you know, obviously we're looking at 2020 here, um, which was the first year of the pandemic. Um, so there may be aspects within that, um, that, you know, people are you know, trading less and therefore they're borrowing less. You can see, um, you know, this, this, this borrowing number come, comes down here. Um, obviously, a lot of people were getting, uh, certainly here in the UK, uh, were getting kind of state-backed loans at a standard 3% rather than perhaps uh, what these guys wanted to be able to charge. But still, um, you know, reasonably, you know, reasonably, um, uh, uh, you know, high levels of, of income. Uh, scroll down a little bit further. Um, these are the costs of running the business. Now, um, well, what we've got here is, uh, first of all, we've got impairment. So, so this is basically bad loans. Um, uh, and again, you know, a bit of a spike there. Again, probably pandemic related. You know, there's companies uh, that went bust as a result of the pandemic, uh, the debt they owed. HSBC and other banks, you know, they, they couldn't obviously pay and then HSBC had to write it off. So a little bit of a spike there. Um, and uh, we'd expect maybe a little bit of a hangover into 2021, but that should settle down to a kind of long term average of what's that uh, two to three billion 
um, uh, each year. So net operating income is lower than previous years. Um, uh, and, and I think that that looks fairly pandemic related, which means that it is temporary. Uh, the cost of running the business, employee compensation, comp and ben, okay, the biggest cost to a bank is those very, very, very well-paid bankers. Now, not every banker is well-paid. A lot of the people who sit in the uh, uh, in your local branch of HSBC uh, certainly won't be earning multi-billion dollar bonuses, um, but there are some very, very high, and that's quite a high number. So we typically kind of compare these two numbers um, and 50%, it's just under 50%. We don't really like it if it goes above 50%. And then they've got all the other costs, and this will be things like IT, uh, regulation will be a very big one, um, IT investment will be a very big one, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's the total expenses, 34 billion, leaving them with an operating profit of about 7 billion, a little bit off the pace from previous years, but no reason why they shouldn't be able to go back to those glory days. They pay out the tax uh, and therefore they got a bottom line profit about six billion dollars. OK, so six billion dollars down from nine, uh, down from 15 uh, in previous years. But, you know, as I said, pandemic is behind behind us. The economy starting to grow again. Inflation taking off interest rates going up. It looks like that there's going to be upward pressure on that number as long as they can keep a lid on these costs over here and not start paying too much to uh, greedy bankers. So there's our income statement. Let's go and have a look at their balance sheets. Uh, here is the balance sheet. So uh, as you mentioned, Moeed, very, very, very big balance sheet. So nearly $3 trillion in assets. There you go, $3 trillion. So this company is, uh, you know, for, 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 you know, give you an idea, the GDP of the UK is about $2 trillion. So, um, you know, this is a big, a, a big bank. And their biggest number, uh, is these loans and advances. They got loans and advances to customers. Um, uh, there they are. A little bit of loans and advances to bank, other banks as well. Um, but you know, a trillion dollars of loans and advances to customers. And obviously that's where they make them up. And that's really the commercial uh, banking side. Um, they've got some bank, uh, some money sitting on deposit at the central bank. So uh, we think about, you know, sort of the Bank of England is HSBC's bank, whereas HSBC is obviously my bank. Um, uh, you're going to have uh, some things like so Hong Kong certificates of indebtedness. This is this is basically Hong Kong government bonds. Um, they're going to have some derivatives. Uh, this derivatives figure um, uh, not too not too big and what you're going to find on the derivatives is that there's going to be a kind of a match on the other side in fact let's just um uh, scroll that down a little bit so we can see the liabilities so uh, when we look at when we look for derivatives um you know these are futures options and swaps for example and what these banks are usually doing is that they are matching them so you can usually or you should be able to find a, a similar size number in the liabilities and that's what's known as hedging so uh, rather than kind of being exposed what they're doing is that they're kind of they're betting on one side and, and and betting on the other side as well so they're making small amounts but there's you know they are managing their exposure to risk on that um they've got some things that you know special things going on with banks like you know what we call uh, repos for example which is just ways of kind of raising extra cash um some more financial investments etc cetera, etc cetera. um so you know quite a lot um going on there on the on on the on the balance sheet um uh, and on the liability side the biggest liability where do they get the money to lend all that money out they get it from the customers. So in effect, the customers have deposited 1.6 billion uh, and they've lent out a billion dollars. That's kind of um, how we can read that. And then some of that money has also been stuck on deposit. Uh, and then some of it is held in these kind of these trading assets, which can be turned into cash um, very, very quickly if they need to. Uh, and this is a kind of what we call this fractional reserving. So companies, they take money in, they put a bit on deposit and they lend the money, the, the rest of the money out. Um, uh, and that's where a lot of um, uh, uh, you know, proponents of people like crypto, for example, uh, are, are, um, uh, are promoting crypto on the basis that um, uh, there's no fractional reserving or, or you know, uh, certainly not within these sort of type of institutions. So um, there is the liabilities. Um, I'm just trying to look for any sort of other big numbers that are jumping out at us. Nothing really. Again, you know, we've got the repos on the other side of the um, sort of the, the assets. Um, and and so the total liabilities are about 2.8 trillion to total 
uh, assets are about three trillion, and the difference is the equity uh, is this uh, 200 billion. What's in the equity? Um, we've got the uh, uh, mainly the, the, the you know the investment by the shareholders, uh, and then we look down here. We can see that there is a very significant. Sorry, I got the wrong. Uh, figure there um these are uh, retained earnings 141 billion dollars so 141 billion dollars of profits that they've made ever since they started trading but have not yet given back to the shareholders so these guys you know they historically they've you know they've been very profitable they've taken that profit they've reinvested back into the bank and they have grown into you know the behemoth that they are today um in terms of the cash flow um again it's difficult to kind of, you know, pick apart a bank's cash flow, um, mainly because they use cash to make cash. So we're not going to get a, you know, significant amount of, 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 of sort of additional information in the cash flow. It's not as important to them as it is for people like Coca-Cola. I mean, cash is important. Uh, and that was the liquidity uh, crisis, the kind of the credit crunch back in 2008. But for these guys, it's, it's you know, the cash flow statement isn't giving us um, quite so much information. However, I do want to just look at this retained earnings um, uh, and the retained earnings. We can see the profit for the year. So we're just looking at, just so we're clear, we're looking at this column here. We're looking at how much profit that they're making during the year. So this is for 2020. And what are they doing with that profit? So uh, this is the, 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 there's the total profit. There's a little bit of non-controlling interest in there. Um, and we, we, you know, we're looking down here and we're just trying to see, you know, what are they doing with that profit? And, and the answer is that they're not, they're not doing anything with it. They're reinvesting it. So there's no dividends uh, being paid out by these guys. But if we look in prior years, we can see whether they are actually um, uh, paying out dividends or buying back their shares. Um, and the answer is that uh, I can't see any dividends. Yeah, here we go. So um, quite a, a while ago, 2018 was the last time that they were actually paying out dividends. There's the dividend um, uh, payment to shareholders. So doesn't look like they're paying out any dividends at the moment um uh, and they haven't been paying out oh yeah hang on so, so that yeah there's 2019 um there's the dividends in 2019 um and then of course um in 2020 uh they'll have uh, ceased in fact no they did pay out a dividend sorry that's my mistake i missed that um so they paid out but it's a much smaller dividend okay so again um there'll be that kind of that that you know and a redemption of securities um will be sort of buying back their own um, their own debt um, so what are they doing? Uh, they are paying a little bit of a dividend, but not very much. Uh, and again, that'll be a kind of probably a political move more than anything else. It's not like they can't afford to, um, but uh, it, it doesn't look very good if a big bank, if everybody, you know, little companies are going bust and big banks are paying out dividends um, while calling in those loans. So, you know, there's a political aspect to a bank that um, a bank can kind of make money when everybody else is making money, but they kind of have to kind of slightly toe the line um, uh, when other people aren't. Otherwise, um, uh, it, it enters the political arena and people start calling for kind of, you know, banking taxes and all that kind of stuff. So that's a you know, very whistle stop quick look at the finances of HSBC. Um, I'm quite interested in, in banks at the moment, as I said, because, you know, I think that, you know, they're, they're, they're quite interesting from the um, from the perspective of, uh, you know, the potential. So you'll see the market cap is one hundred and thirteen billion. Um, uh, and if we look at their just go back to their balance sheet again. So the balance sheet, just to remind ourselves, the balance sheet, um, there's the, the net assets is this figure here. So if you were to take HSBC and you were to, uh, you know, sell, you know, basically turn all their assets into cash and then pay off their liabilities, you'd end up with $204 billion. So quite interesting to see uh, this company, uh, $204 billion on the balance sheet. Um, and when we look at the income statement, uh, so when we look at the share price, the market cap is $113 billion. Now, that looks to me like they're trading at, you know, pretty much half of their net book value, which looks to me like it's really, really cheap. So any company that's trading at below book value uh, looks like a bargain. P ratio, 15 times earnings. Um, that's a yield of about, you know, 6%, 6.7%, something like that, 6 to 7%. Um, 
which is you know, it's not excessively cheap unless you compare it to America. You know, US is kind of you know, it's on 30 times earnings. So it's half the price. But then, you know, uh, UK stocks generally are. Um, but I would just I just look at the potential there. You know, there's a big potential, I think, for that E to increase. And therefore, if you can pick something up where the E is relatively low and will increase, then that P ratio becomes actually um, uh, quite um, uh, uh, fortuitous. And the dividend yield, as we said, dividend was suppressed, I think, in the previous year, um, again, because of the pandemic. Uh, and so I think that the dividend will come back um, uh, and that dividend yield. So HSBC, um, it, we looked at Lloyds Bank a while ago, Moeed, and, and I kind of felt Lloyds Bank was a real bargain. Um, HSBC, I just think is, is, is cheap as well. Now, again, we got lots of investors on this and I get a few comments from people talking about 20 baggers and 30 baggers and I'm going to make my fortune, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not something that you're going to be able to do um, on, on HSBC. It's not, it, you know, it's not going to go, you know, 20 times current price, for example. Well, I, I, you know, maybe I'd be wrong there, but I, I don't expect it to go 20 times, but I would expect that this is, you know, that there's going to be upward pressure on this share price. That's that's kind of my take on this. So um, I'm not saying it can't go down, but I think that you know the the, the future is looking pretty bright um, for HSBC. So there is my there's my analysis, uh, uh, um, Moeed. Uh, I'm for disclosure, I'm not a shareholder in HSBC. Uh, as a result of my analysis, I'm kind of thinking, mm, you know, maybe I might you know, you know get some exposure to it. Again, a well diversified portfolio. Uh, you know, hold long term, not for the trading. Um, uh, looks looks a pretty a, a pretty good opportunity to me. Yep, there, there you have it. Again, like I said, hashtag we're not financial advice or investment advisors. Uh, this is our, these are our own opinions here. Uh, of course, there's a lot more to look at in terms of an investment thesis and whether you're going to invest in a company like this. But we look at the share price because it's part of the fundamental financial analysis as well. It gives you context. Uh, so that's why we're looking at that. So, yeah, as, as Ted mentioned, a um, couple of videos I would recommend that you look at after this one. So number one is uh, Lloyds Bank. So another British uh, financial institution that we analyze. And also, if you want to look at an alternative financial institution, uh, I recommend that you look at another company that we uh, analyze called SoFi Technologies. Uh, so they're an American, biz American business. Uh, they just acquired a company and actually they've just attained their banking charter, uh, which, uh, which actually gives you an alternative view for an alternative bank as well. So that will give you a bit more of a context. So uh, until the next uh, video, thank you very much. Please continue to like, share, subscribe, and uh, do leave a note in the comment section if you would like us to analyze a company for you. We get a ton of those requests and, and leave some context as to why you want us to... Um, uh, help you analyze this business so that can help us determine whether you are high up in the priority ladder and advance your video as fast as possible. So until the next video, thank you, Ted. Thank you, everyone else. Catch you later, Moe.